So with our further ado, that kind of leads me into what we're going to explore. And we're coming from the stance or the question, what is the quest of life for the believer? For the believer, what is the quest of life? Now, many would believe, many scientists, many, many philosophers, even some that might call us conspiracy theorists, right? Believe that, in fact, uh, that we are living in some sort of, say, simulation. Anybody know what a simulation is? Yeah. Oh, somebody said Nintendo. Uh, go ahead. It's like the act of, or a process of simulating real life. Uh, yes, it, it can. It can simulate, a simulation can essentially be, um, anything. of anything, you know what I mean? But it's a, a, in a sense of the best examples I can give those out there who maybe do not know, if you're current enough today, you've played games or titles such as Minecraft where you can create an environment. Right, the creator, the programmer has the ability to essentially shape this whole world. Or if you play like open world concept games like Grand Theft Auto, and you see, you or, or better yet, if you play Sim City, if you played The Sims, and you see how you're able to, as the programmer, as the creator, you have the ability to create this whole narrative. You can build a whole entire world, your own home, your 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 own city, or if you've just played the modern 2K24, the My Player environment would be close to a simulation where you have your My Player, right, who was built and shaped however the designer or the creator has shaped them to be, right, with skills and abilities. Uh, you can even determine his skill sets, what kind of shooter, what kind of defender. You can even dress him a certain way, and then you insert him into this world where he is now able to partake in activities, activities that would essentially uh, uh, assimilate what things we would do in the real world. So this character in, in particular in the NBA 2K24 world is the my player. And the, the person behind the controls can generate his own avatar, if you want to say, or his own, uh, 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 what is that, RPG, a role player, right? Where now I am the person that is constructing or in control of the said avatar who is a representation of me in this simulated environment. Does that, does that make sense, right? So many, many believe, whether they're scientists, whether they're philosophers, and even if you want to get down to your everyday conspiracies, right, that we are living in fact in some sort of simulation of multi-dimensional simulation or you know a matrix if you want to say right we all saw the movie the matrix some of these things are things that we have heard right that essentially our physical world is not the real world right would you agree with that that maybe it's possible that the world we are partaking in though all these different things are happening wars rumors of wars Natural disasters, life, people are being born, people are dying, people are taking on new careers. Uh, you have uh, inventions or innovations, uh, things happening, technological advances, all of these different moving parts and things happening. But there would be many that would suggest or believe that we are in fact living into in some sort of supernatural, multi-dimensional simulation. Right, that the physical world that we are partaking in is not in fact the real world. Does that make sense, right? And this is where you can get into some, just some kind of news facts or science facts, if you want to say, kind of fall into that science technology world uh, where you get CERN and the particle accelerators, right? We know a little bit about that, right? The God particle, right? You, you know a little bit about that. You know about how they're colliding these things, right? Right. Some people think that they're opening portals to other dimensions, demonic uh, worlds and supernatural spirit worlds, right? All of this kind of stems from the idea that our physical world is in fact not necessarily the real world, that there is somehow other worlds, other dimensions all around us, and we are kind of just in this simulation. Now, if we were to take that stance, that in fact our real physical world or the physical world is not the real world. We as the believer can probably agree to this. Why? Let's tap into it. Let's tap into it. If you're just tapping in with us, welcome to Covenant of Believers. Today, our topic is coming from the simulation, the quest of life, the quest of life. We're going to dive into this. Now, the physical world, not, uh, 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 not necessarily being our real world, kind of ties into what Bible already suggests to us. The Bible already suggests to us heavenly, right? 
heavenly, that we are not just what? Natural beings, but we are what? Some type of spiritual beings, right? And that there are supernatural spiritual things happening all around us. This begins to allude to us that the Bible goes so far to say, uh, uh, do not be afraid, right? Or do not marvel at who can even harm the physical body, but me be more concerned, be conscious of, of, of what? Who has the authority over your soul? Why? Because they determine, right? They have the authority to determine where your soul goes. This would elude us to believe that though we are active here in the physical flesh, that there is another world or another dimension or that the world or the reality that we are living in is not just simply what we take it to be. Does that make sense? Right? So if we were to take this theory, right, and kind of walk it through, God would essentially probably be the programmer, right? So we understand Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning, God, the Elohim, created what? The heavens and the earth. Right? The heavens and the earth. He formed them out of nothing. That's what makes him so supreme. That he is not like us. Where we create things, but we create it out of something. Right? God, the almighty all power, the universal life source. Right? Literally spoke and said, let there be light. And what happened? It produced light. And to this very day, we have light. We have the sun that sits where it is. We have the moon that's placed where it's at. That same God spoke, right, and, and told the waters to divide themselves and place a firmament and division all around us to create the world that we currently have and exist in. So the universal life force, the creator, the programmer, right, in the beginning, God, the Elohim, created the heavens and earth, formed them from nothing, right? Spoke these things into existence. That's what separates God from us. Because though we might be able to create things, we don't recreate them from something. Does that make sense? Right? The chair you have is created from a substance that was produced by whom? The living God. Right? The particles, I don't care, the material, whether it be wood, whether it be iron, whether it be uh, 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 protons, neutrons, atoms. These are all things that mankind itself did not create, but came from a source. That source, we as the believer, we conclude that to be God. Right? The triune God. Right? Jesus, the universal life force of all. So, here's something very interesting about this term called earth or the earth. When you begin to tap into this in the Hebrew, it has a translation. And in the Strong's, it would be 1093 dot. And it says this. Properly, the physical earth, the arena we live in, which operates in space and time, which God uses to prepare us for eternity. Hear that. The physical earth. Is the arena or the arena that we live in operates in the space and time which God uses to prepare you or prepare us for eternity. Preparing us for something other than what? This present reality. Something other than what we now see and interact with. Eternity is something different. It's, it's highlighting or alluding to a separate space or realm, right? Something other than what we now know to exist, right? So it says that earth or the earth can be translated in the Hebrew to, to, to define or suggest or, as it says here, the arena. To be an arena we live in which operates in space and time, which God uses this. To prepare you, me, us, all of us out there for eternity. Right? It has another statement. It says the physical earth is temporary. It is a, a probationary place to live out moral preferences through the body, i.e., as free will or free moral agents. It goes on to say, in this way, God makes an eternal record of everything we do on earth. Through faith, each scene of life becomes equally and eternally significant. This right here begins to correlate with other Bible, other scriptures, where the Bible says that there is a book of life, where God has taken account of record of every human being, and that at the day of judgment, every man will have to give an account for himself. So this 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 definition of the term the earth or earth 
would elude us to understand that this right here, this realm, this time and space that we're operating in is nothing more but a space that has been created for us or for God to prepare us for eternity, for us to essentially, what the Bible would say in some other way, work out our soul salvation. So we say, what is the quest of life? What is the real purpose and meaning of life? In this quote-unquote simulation that we're a part of where God is the creator, he created us, right? He created this whole entire universe. The Bible lets us know that God has named every star, placed them in, in their unique position, right? He placed the sun where it's at. He placed the moon where it's at, the world, the winds, the waters, the, the, the way we spin on our axis, if you want to say, all follows the order and way of Jesus Christ, the creator. Now, the Hebrew would uh, uh, suggest to us that this thing called earth is really nothing more than an arena, a space, right, in which, in, in which we live. Right, that operates in according to space and time where God has used this space to prepare you for eternity. Right, where God has created this place, though the physical earth is temporary, it's a probationary place to live out what? Your moral preferences, right? Through this body that God has given us, being free moral agents, you have the ability. Right? Of, with free will to determine if you're going to be good, bad, if you're going to live right, if you're going to serve God, if you're going to heck, even if you want to believe in God. Right? It, people, just because they decide not to believe in God, they're not just falling out and dying and we never see him again. There are many of us who are walking the earth who do not acknowledge God to be God or him to be the universal life force of all things or him to be the source of life or the creator of things. Right? But it's funny to me that the this... This Hebrew definition of earth begins to give us some understanding that the world we are living in, this physical world, is in fact not what? The real world. God is not preparing us necessarily to live here in this realm, in this space, but he is preparing us, right? Everything, it will almost seem that everything you have experienced Everything you thought, that, that stress, that worry, that conflict, right, that disappointment, that hurt, that pain, uh, uh, that anguish, that, that even that trauma, the, it seems here that heroes allude to that all of this has been set for one nuclear uh, uh, reason or one core goal or one core reason or purpose. And the quest of life is simply in the Hebrew that God is, 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 has designed this thing. To prepare you for eternity. Now, there's another uh, 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 he, uh, Hebrew breakdown of the term earth, and it's the 776. And these are the numbers you can put in in a strong concordance and pull these terms up. And it refers to the physical earth as God's arena, the physical theater in which our eternal destiny freely plays out. That would suggest that all of your choices, all of your actions, all are contributing, right, to some type of destination. So whether you truly believe in God, you believe in heaven, you believe in hell, you believe that you need to be saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, these terms have, have a, in the Hebrew, are at least suggesting that this place called earth, the physical earth, is an arena or a theater, right, that is in, in which our eternal destiny is being played out. And how are we contributing to that, right? How are we playing a role in that, right? Every day you are faced with choices. Every day you are faced with, 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 with uh, possibilities, right? Every day that life breathes in you and that you are partaking in this thing called life, whether you choose to be conscious to this or not, it appeared to be that in this simulation called the earth, called life, every choice that you make is factoring to some destination. Are we there? Are we learning something? Yes. So the Bible, Colossians, the first chapter, the 16th verse, it says, for by him, who was him? By God, by the creator, by the universal source of life, Jesus Christ, right? By him, all things were created. We get that. All things was created. What? In heaven and on earth. 
things visible, what is visible, what we can touch, what we can feel, what we can kind of make connection with, with our, uh, our senses, right? From smell, taste, sound, and sight, all the physical things. And it goes to say, and the invisible things. Again, alluding to some type of world within worlds. A world that is full of many dimensions, right? Or many heavens or heavens, right? This what this goes into. If the visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities or all things were created and exist through him. And that is by his activity and for him. What that kind of goes to, listen, if God has created all things and everything is working and operating to prepare you for a destination, all things have been placed that you would be able to work out your own soul salvation. All things. That means even that chaos in your life has been placed and allowed to be to do what? So that you might work out your soul salvation. That your soul will not be lost. Are, are you hearing me today? That God's divine design. It's so full of his love for you that it all works for your good. It's all engineered. It's all programmed. So what? So that you that, that you would be prepared, that you would make a decision, huh? that you would come to a conclusion to say and know that God is real and that he is the creator of all things and that the only way that you truly have life is through him. Psalms 24 and 1 tells us that the whole earth, the earth is the Lord and everything that is in it, the world and all who live in it. God is the creator of all things, even in the realm that we participate in, even in the realm that we participate in. So when you worried about how you look, you worried about how you feel, God is worried about the place of your soul. What, what's the condition of your soul? If we were to take these Hebrew terms as truth, that all of this is God's arena, that we are part of a physical a theater, a simulation that's all geared towards us, being able to make choices that have an impact on the soul. So how do we know this? When God created the heavens and the earth, he didn't just stop there. He created what? The body or the avatar, if you want to say, or the RPG, the role player, right? In Genesis 2 and 7, it says, then the Lord God formed what? Who? Me, man, right? Created man from the dust of the earth and breathed what? Into his nostrils, the breath of life. And at that point, man became a living, active, breathing soul, animated, right? He became an animated being. Right, the same way when you turn on the PC, you turn on the PlayStation, right? What happens to that character? He instantaneously become what? Animated and controlled by whom? Um, the player, the person behind the controls. You are the individual that are at the controls of your character in this life. If that character is Jojo, if that character is, is Hannah, if that character is, 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 is Tiffany, Michelle, Jimmy, John, you are at the controls with the power and ability to interact in this simulation called life. Making decisions that's going to impact the destination of what you would know to be eternity. So the Bible goes on to tell us something else in regards to the body, that this body, right, is suited for this world, is suited to exist in this simulation, in this reality. First Corinthians, the 15th chapter, the 44th verse, and it says, it is sown a natural body, a body that is mortal, a body that is suited to this earth, to this realm, to this dimension, to this place, right? And it is raised a spiritual body. This is the that that is already making a separation that though we exist in this realm, in this space, right? And we have the power to interact and make choices, right? We are living this thing called life each and every day that there is something else. There is something else that's that's more important. And it says it raised it is raised a spiritual body, one that is immortal, one that is suited to the heaven. 
one that is suited to the supernatural, one that is suited to the spiritual. As surely as there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. So this again will tap right into the theory or the idea that this thing called life is in fact some sort of simulation with multiple dimensions or a simulation within a dimension and outside of it, right? Is this even greater, bigger universe beyond what we can really imagine or fantasize? Kind of like if you're watching one of those Marvel movies, right, and you're getting into uh, um, Ant-Man, and he's going into what world? Quantum world. He's going into the quantum world, a world that exists where? Inside. Inside, right? And it's so micro, it's so small that we don't see it, right? We have no impact on it. In a sense, right? But there's a oh, when he when he goes into this in, in, into this world, it's a whole nother vast world, and those that reside in that world aren't even aware of us, and we that reside in this plane or in this dimension are not aware of what them, right? So our bodies are suited for this realm, for this world. Now. If you're just tapping in with us, welcome to Covenant of Believers. Today's lesson, we are talking or exploring the idea of this simulation, this simulation and the quest or the quest for life, God's quest for our life, right? God's plan, right? So now we are discussing the body, the body, the body is suited for this realm, for this space. The Bible lets us know that. The Bible also goes to give us some more understanding of the body. 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, the first verse. For we know that if the if the earthly tent, which is our physical body here that they're referring to, our physical body, which is our house, is torn down through death. Now, we understand that though we are born, everybody is born and everybody dies, right? We may not know when or how or the hour or when it is our time, but ultimately everything that is born has a death date. Every, every, every plant, every animal, every, everything in this realm, in this, in this simulation, if you want to say, in this space, this dimension we call life, in our world, there exists this end or beginning and an end. Everything has a beginning, a start, and everything has an end. So this, this scripture, 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, the first verse, is saying to us, for we know that if the earthly tent, if the earthly body, the body that has been created from the dust of the earth, right, and, and, and God breathed his, in, his breath of life in us and animated us, created us to be a living being. They're talking about the flesh that we reside in, this suit, right, if you want to say this house or this tent, this body that we reside in, right? It is temporary, which our house is torn down through death. We know as the believer, we have a building from God. We have another body, right? Or if you wanted to say another avatar, we have another body that's fitted, right? Uh, uh, for the eternal, it says. So we have, another, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Second Corinthians, the fifth chapter, the first verse, for we know if the earthly tent, if this body that we operate in, right, that houses what? Our, 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 our soul, right? With our will, mind, and emotions that houses this thing, that if this physical body, which we understand in this realm is temporary, it has a death Date. Your body has a death date. It has a death date in which it will shut down. It will no longer be able to house or contain you, the soul, the living animated soul. You, it says, which this house is torn down through death. We have a building from God. A house not made by hands. What is that saying? That no matter what technology advances they come out with, no matter what innovations, no matter what we create here on the earth, the soul that's been given by the life of God, the breath of God, can only be built another home right through the eternal hands of God. Amen. By the universal life source. Only the creator can create us something that will be able to house us for eternity and exist in the in, in eternal in the heavens. 
So here's the separation when God created the what? The heavens and the earth. Heavens being plural and the earth being singular. This would elude us to understand that this thing called life is nothing mere but a glimpse, but a simulation. An arena for you to work out your soul's salvation. Arena for you to determine if I shall give God the glory. You have the ability, the free will to choose Christ, to choose to believe. What else was it telling us about the Bible? So we understand that this body is suited for this simulation here we call life. This earth, this realm, this dimension. We understand that in this realm we exist and there is both life and death. Every body, right? Every body or every earthly tent, everything that's created of the earth has a beginning and an end. And through death, right, we understand that each and every moment of every day, the clock ticks closer and closer to our own individual death thing, to our own uh, uh, visitation from death, right? And we know this, that the body is temporal. What else does the Bible begin to, the, to uh, 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 um, express to us about this body? The Bible also goes to uh, uh, referred to the body as a house or a temple, right? And when we begin to break that down in the Hebrew, and if you want to look that up, you can just uh, put in uh, 3614 right online on the strong coordinates, and it will give you this definition, this term that begins to define an inhabited edifice, right? A dwelling, right? It begins to refer to the body as a house or a habitation. And in the Hebrew, it begins to let us know that that is a dwelling place, a habitation of the body as dwell as a dwelling place for the spirit. So this only begins to confirm when uh, the, in, in the beginning, when Jesus created man from the clay, right? What did he do? He breathed life into us or the breath of life, right? animating us, making us a living being, and this body has the ability to what? Be the place of the spirit. Now the question is, which spirit will have authority or have residency inside of you? Now if you understand scripture, you know that the demonic demons are disembodied spirits. Come on here. So you, this body suit, has the ability or is created as a dwelling, a habitation. The Bible lets us know that God has ordained the body, right, with what? With his reason and purpose that we would be his temple here in the earth, that he could do what? His spirit. You know that thing called the Holy Spirit? That right when the Bible says that they receive what? The Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, right? And it did something, right, to it to be the indwell, right, to live on the inside of them. So the Bible lets us know that our body not only is it suited to operate and function in this realm, right? It is temporary. It is constantly every day dying, right? It, is, it has a death date. Whether you choose to believe in God or not, you're going to meet death regardless, right? Only way we have eternal is in God's body, the new body that is created through the creator. Now, your body is a tabernacle or a house, right, with the ability or as the definition says of the body. It's the body that's a dwelling place of the spirit. Now, something else interesting. The Bible references this term called the matrix. That might surprise you, but it because it surprised me. And I thought I knew some Bible. But as you go back and read the Bible, the Bible in the King James Version references this thing called the matrix. Now, understand the term womb is also translated in the Hebrew, Rashim, right? And that's 87358 for those who want to look that up and fact check it, right? And it is also translated as the matrix, right? So the matrix, uh, so take, for example, Jeremiah 1 and 5, a very popular scripture, right? Jeremiah 1 and 5 says, and this is God speaking to Jeremiah. He said, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, right? Here is the creator. Here is the programmer. Here is the developer of all things saying, before, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, right? 
And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Now, I want you to read that or hear that with the translation. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the matrix, hear that, I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. This is again alluding to what the Hebrew definition of the earth is. This is nothing more than a simulation created by the creator to allow what? Every living soul, once they have come through the matrix, to live and, and, and be prepared for eternity. So once you have arrived in this realm, in this dimension, in this plane, you have the obligation, this free will that you have, this agent of, of, of this, this is the ability to make decisions is not to be taken lightly, but it is actually uber critical that you become conscious that every decision, every choice of how you determine who you are, it plays out for a destination. And this alludes to what the Bible calls the book of life. Don't you know the Bible says God knows every hair on your head? Now, all the multi-billion people on the world, God knows every hair on your head. That's the power of the creator. So, Jeremiah 1 and 5 in the Amplified, before I formed you in the matrix, I knew you and approved of you as my chosen instrument. And before you were born, I consecrated you to myself as my own and have appointed you as a prophet to the nations. I gave you a specific role in this realm. I, I, I determined you are going to be my prophet. And the Bible goes to tell us that uh, God has called us his instruments here in the earth. You, me, all of us have a purpose, a divine purpose, a divine role, if you want to say, a divine calling, right, uh, determined by the creator. So the Bible identifies the womb as the matrix. That is actually in scripture. And he said, before I formed you in the matrix, I knew you. I'm before I determined, blue eyed Brown skin, right? Six feet height, uh, a, a, a strong voice, a, a, a talent, an ability, a skill. Before you came out, I was picking these things out. I said he was going to be strong. I said he was going to be an overcomer. I said he was going to be gifted. He was going to have this talent, this ability. I said he was going to be this. This makes it even more brings even more attention to those of us who right now are living in a society where we want to now become the creator and we don't want we don't want to accept how the creator has made us to be right now we are in a warfare right with and the warfare is on God's creation because if God be the universal life force and the creator of all things as the Bible tells us and he has be before you was even produced in this earth, right? Back in the matrix, he was determining who you were, your eye color, your smile, your, 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 your identity. And now you are here saying, I don't want to be a male. I don't want to be a female. I want to make, I want to be able to determine who I am and what I am. But the Bible alludes to us here that that free will is not necessarily for that. It's for you to be working out your soul salvation. So, so, so here we are. The body is what? The body and, 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 and this thing called the simulation is, is in fact, uh, 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 if you want to say, for lack of example, uh, uh, an avatar, right? Uh, and, and, and we know that God formed the body out of the dust of the earth and he breathed, right, uh, his spirit or the, uh, the, the breath of life inside of us. The Bible lets us know that this body is suited for this realm, right? It, 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 has, been, it has been formed and shaped and, and suited to exist and operate in this space. But it also lets us know that, that the body is temporary, that it has a death date, and that this body is also 
a house or a tabernacle or an earthly vessel, right, with the ability or is the dwelling place of the spirit. And that the womb, the Bible also refers to the womb as a matrix or the matrix. Now, you are designed. You are created. You are not an accident. You are not just some sheer uh, 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 um, product of evolution or a big bang theory. It would seem that the Bible is alluding to that there has been much thought put into uh, uh, your creation and the world that you are living in. And that is for a divine purpose, that there is actually a quest or a purpose or a reason for this thing called life. Now, in this quest, if you ever play any type of video games, right, there's always the main storyline, right? The main storyline, and then it's filled with a lot of side missions or submissions that all factor into the main storyline, but that does not necessarily uh, change what the main goal is of the story, right? Does that make sense, right? Anybody that plays any games, most games, about 99% of games, all have a main storyline. Now, within that storyline, there are sub-quests or side missions that you can partake in that do contribute to the story, right? They kind of even impact the story, but it doesn't necessarily change what the main goal of the storyline is. Now, I say all that to say, right, in this thing called life that we're living, if we're asking ourselves, what is the true quest or purpose of this thing called life? And if we take the Bible for what we believe it has been suggesting to us, that life essentially is an arena or a theater or a simulation for us to work out our soul salvation, right? For us to, uh, well, every choice, everything that we do to play a factor into wherever we will spend eternity, wherever eternity is, wherever heavens or heavens or whatever that exists, that everything we are doing now contributes to the determination of God's judgment, right? And I know the Bible says that every man shall meet the king for himself. And he should either say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, thou enter in, or he's going to send you to hell. That's the way the Bible picks it out. So, but in the story, so we understand that the main conclusion is some type of eternal destination of where the you, the real you, not the flesh, not the lips my son playing with right now while he's in church, right? Not that. That you is going to fade away. The you you see in the mirror. Right? Light skin, curly hair, right? That you's gonna fade away. But the you, the inter you, the real you, the you that exists on the inside of you, the true you, everything that you're doing with the physical you impacts the real you, the soul of you. So though you might live life like, hey, I got another tomorrow. I got another day, I got another month, another week, another year, right, uh, 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 to, to, to take life serious, right? The Bible is alluding to us that you better really take life serious because, one, your body, the physical you, is temporary. And any given moment could be the moment where now you face death and now have to face the judgment of your eternity. What will the book of life say about you? What would be the record? Were you consumed with the side missions? My career, my family, relationships, friends, my social status, huh? societal norms, right? Pop culture, who Beyonce, what Beyonce doing today? What Nicki Minaj, what they doing today? What Carly B saying today? What, what, what Lil Baby and them doing today, right? What, what LeBron doing? Is LeBron playing? Is he not playing? It, it, what's, what's going on? What, what, are you consumed with the side missions of life? All of these things created by the creation. Wealth. Do I have enough money? What am I going to do next? I don't, like, I don't like this job no more. They don't like me. They talking about me. Are they trying to take with minds? The sub missions in quest of life. Where am I going to go to school at? You know, what kind of life I'm going to live? The Bible's in doing that. All of that is minor. It's minute when it comes to where your soul is going to have residency. 
Where will your soul be in this thing called eternity? For all of these things that we are worried about, what we going to wear today? I don't like my sneakers. I don't like my hair. You know, did I brush my teeth? They are temporary. They are temporary. They are not eternal things. This is why the Bible says in Mark 8, 36, it says, for what does it profit a man, right, to gain the whole world, to have this great life, to have all these experiences and forfeit his soul? For the realm you are living in, this simulation that you are living in, it is only desire, it's temporary, it had a beginning, and God has a defined, definite end. Many right now are speculating on what the end times are, and, what's, and when is it going to happen? When is the second coming of the king? The Bible is saying, listen, you need to focus on it. What's the status and condition of your soul? Are you even ready for the king to return? Yes. Oh, come on here. Somebody say, yes, I am. Yes, I am. If you don't have a confident yes, you need to be taking all of this time and space that God has given you, this space that he has created for you to work out your soul salvation. You need to be taking the time out to, to, to get that thing in order, to get your house in order, because it's not going to matter. Right where you worked at. It's not going to matter who was your friends, who was talking about you, who liked you, what you wore today, how much money you had in the bank. It's not going to matter, right, if the dollar is crashing or not, if if if, if there's going to be a famine or another virus. or if, It doesn't matter if your soul is not at the ready and at a place to where you know with certainty I'm going to receive a well done, that good and faithful servant. Walk them into the house of the Lord. So the Bible says, Mark 8, 36, what does it profit us? What does it profit us to have all the knowledge, to be educated, to have the career, or have family and friends and relationships and meet all the societal norms and, and, and have the social statuses, right? Have wealth, have this or that. What does it profit us, right? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul and eternal life in God's kingdom. What would you really give? Would sleep be enough of an exchange? I lose some sleep so I can get up and pray and worship you. I will sacrifice some friends so that I know that I am resting my soul in eternity and the kingdom of God. And I will not wake up in hell in torment and judgment. What would be the sacrifice? What would be worth it? Would having friends be worth it? Would having money be worth it? Would having, have, having a great job or, or having all the things that we love, the cars, the houses, the, the, the electronics, all the stuff that we are in love with, would it be worth it? What would you then exchange? It's many people right now that are on their deathbed and they are having the realization, they are having a reckoning right now because they realize I lived all of this time, and now in a moment, it's all going to be over. And now they are evaluating their choices. Now, things that, all the things that was once so important, so critical, that meant so much to them, don't have the same meaning. Why? Because this scripture rings true. For what would a man give in exchange for his soul and eternal life in God's kingdom? When you come to the conclusion and realize that no matter what you said you believe, I'm at the end. No matter what it is that you said you thought you knew, I'm at my end. What will a man give in exchange to know that his soul is going to have residency in God's kingdom? So what is the quest for life? What is the real point of this? The real point is that your soul salvation, Philippians 2 and 12 lets us know. He says, whereby or wherefore my beloved... As ye have always obeyed, now as in my presence only, or not, excuse me, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. He says, work out your own soul salvation with fear and trembling. To whom? To God. Being conscious of the creator. I don't care what's going on in the world. I don't care what's the next news headline. I don't care if 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 Joe Biden get impeached today. I don't care what's going on. If Trump gonna be the next president. I don't care what's the next pop culture social media headline. That 
man. Say, in the absence, work out your own soul salvation. Being conscious of the fact that no man knows the hour of when his judgment is going to come. No man knows the hour of when God is going to return. So if you're waiting for some indication that, oh, God's going to come back September 23rd, let me get it together. You can die today. If you're waiting to say, well, I'm still young. I, I got life to live. Know that you can die today. Many have died at your age or younger. Many thought they had tomorrow, so they didn't get it right with family. They didn't apologize. They didn't let go of some of this grief and, and this gripe and this, and this anger and uh, uh, the, this, this the tension and division. So they harbored all of this stuff on the inside of them for years. Not knowing that today is the day. You have an obligation. I don't care if you're five years old, 13 years old. You have an obligation to take this time and this reality and this domain in this simulation, if you want to say, to use it to work out your own soul salvation. Luke, the 13th chapter, the 24th verse says, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able to. Why will you not be able to enter into God's gate? Would it be because, you know what, I didn't honor God. I didn't place God first in my life. I didn't pray. I didn't fast. I didn't really read the word. I didn't really have a, a thirst and a hunger for God's righteousness, for his commandments. But everything else was important. Who posted what was important? Who said what? Oh, what's going on now in the world? What's the new headline? What's this? What's that? If your soul is not secure, what does it matter? What's going to stop you from being entering into God's kingdom? What's going to stop you from being marked as God's children? All the stuff that we are getting consumed with, it really don't matter if you're not saved. See, all of that stuff is the submissions. That's the side missions. That's the side stories. But it's not the main story. The main story is when you meet your creator, will he say he is pleased with you? Will he be able to look down and see, you know what, when everybody else woke up and didn't even acknowledge me, you took time out of your day to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for waking me up this morning. Thank you for making life for me. Thank you for grace and mercy and love and protection. Will he be able to look down and say, I'm pleased with my servant, Joe? Why? Because, you know, he made time for me. He sacrificed relationships. He sacrificed his own success. He sacrificed folk being happy with him so that he can what? Edify God so that God could get the glory out of his life. He didn't wait for tomorrow. He didn't wait for next week. He decided and determined that right here, right now, I'm going to work out my soul salvation. I'm going to live for Christ with fear and trembling. So you have to fight believer, believer. No matter what's going on in the world, I don't care how much food you store up for the possible famine. I don't care if you say you're not getting the next COVID shot. I don't care if Trump is your next president or not. I don't care if the dollar fall. The believer has one mission, and that is salvation. The Bible tells us, 1 Timothy 6 and 12, to fight the good fight of faith, even in conflict with evil. Even when I'm faced with adversity, even when I don't, when I'm uncertain of the world around me, will we have this house tomorrow? Will we have the income tomorrow? What will life be tomorrow? I have to fight the good fight of faith. What? As in working out my soul salvation. Because it does not matter if I have the house with 3,000 square feet, but I die and go to hell. It does not matter if I have I eat steak and, 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 and lamb and lobster, but I die and go it don't matter how many vacations I take if I die and go to hell. But I have one mission, and that's to fight the good fight of faith, even in conflict with what? How I feel, what I think, what I think I know. How, what, it don't matter what the guy on the job say. Will I stay true to what God has told me to do? It don't matter if folk like me or don't like me. What I'm in conflict with, will I fight the good fight for faith? Take hold of eternal life. 
Here, the, the scripture is saying you can't wait until it's over to take hold of eternal life. You got to make decisions right now, even in the face of adversity. I'm tired, but I still choose to pray. I don't want to, but I still get in my word. I don't like such and such, and instead, I still choose to hold my peace and let God, the creator, do what? Fight for me. I don't take it into my own hands, but I understand the weapons of my warfare are not carnal, but I lean to who? The creator of all things. I acknowledge Acknowledge him and believe. That's why it says, fight the good fight for what? Faith. What is faith? My belief. I hit on my belief. I hammer down on my belief every time I choose to acknowledge him as the creator. Many say they believe in God. But when it's time to believe, that's where you find out. That's where you find out who is really living for Christ. But he encouraged here, Timothy, he said, Timothy, be sure that you fight the good fight of faith. Even in conflict with evil, when you face with, that's when you know, I know I'm right and they wrong. Will I still choose Christ? Will I still choose to align with my faith in the principles of what I believe? Take hold of eternal life to which you were called. And you made the good confession of faith in the presence of witnesses. What is he saying? For all of you out there who have said, I believe in God. I am a quote-unquote Christian. This is your obligation. To now stand on that faith. Now. We understand we must not only fight the good fight, but we must learn to be content. Why am I saying this? Because the times we are being faced with, every day there's something new. Every day there's a new headline. Every day there's a new worry, a new trouble. Something else is coming. This is happening. We got to learn, as Philippians 4 and 11 tell us, uh, not that I speak, as Paul has said, not that I speak uh, 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 from any personal need. What he said, not that I'm saying that I need some, but I've learned to be content. And be self-sufficient through Christ, satisfied to the point where I am not disturbed or uneasy, right? Regardless of my circumstance. Why? Because if God be real, and if we say we are believers and God is the universal creator, life source of all things, right? I know I got something that others don't have. What? That I'm acquainted with. The creator, huh? me and the creator, we like this, we bonded together. I'm now in, I'm the son of God. You got to hear this. Will God forsake me? Will God leave me? No matter what circumstances I find myself in, Paul is saying here, regardless of any circumstances, we have to learn to what? Trust God. He says, I know how to get along and live humbly in difficult times. How many of us really know how to be humble in difficult times? We tend to be what? Complaining in difficult times, anxious in difficult times, worried. And it ain't even got to get difficult. Soon as difficult is on the horizon, you start getting all kind of frustrated. But Paul said, I've learned to live. How can he now be humble in difficult times? Why? Because if God be God, and I am a follower of his, and I believe that he has all power, there is nothing. If I'm in this place, it's because what? He wills it so. He says to live humble in difficult times. I also know how to enjoy abundance and live in prosperity. See, that's the problem. See, we don't know how to live and be humble in difficult times. We only excited and in good faith in the times of prosperity and abundance. We have a great joy. The joy of the Lord is highly present when everything is working out the way we want. When money's flowing the way we want, the career is going the way we want, life is going the way we want, we get vacations and this and that and the third, everything is going the way we want, we find the joy of the Lord. He said, in, in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing life, of living in what this simulation we call life. On the quest of life, I've learned the secret that whether I'm well fed or going hungry, whether I have an abundance or being in need, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Hear that. He finds peace in the fact that all things 
I am capable of existing in every type of situation and circumstance, not because of my own power, but because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. He that is operating in the world does not have power or su superiority to the universal life force. That NPC, anybody know what an NPC is? That NPC, right? That 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 demonic spirit, that wicked spirit, that them NPCs that that's operating, right? That's been placed strategically for you to work out your soul's salvation. Have no su superiority over the universal life source. So he's saying, I can do all things. I can be humble. I can have joy. I can face adversity. I can face all kind of questionable circumstances, right? Because of him who strengthens and empowers me. I am ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses me with inner strength and peace. God, the creator of all things, controls all things. Understand that. That's why Romans 8 and 28, and we know that God, causes all things to work together for the good. Together for what? As he has planned it. Hear that. As he has planned and orchestrated it. Understand that it ain't an accident if it's flooding. It ain't an accident if it's hell storms. It ain't an accident if it's wars and rumors of war. It ain't an accident. God has allowed it and ordained it so. So me as the believer, no matter what the next headline is, I know that all things work according to what? The good. Why? Because I love Christ Jesus. The only way you're going to be worried is because you ain't really established your faith, your relationship in Christ Jesus. The Bible says that his word cannot return back to himself void. So once he has spoken this thing into the simulation of this thing called life, all things work for them, right? All things. We know that we have great confidence that God, who is deeply concerned about us, causes all things. He causes all things. He causes all things. It don't matter what it looks like. He causes all things to work together as a plan for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his plan and purpose. Believer, the earth we are living in, as the Hebrew breaks it down, the earth we are living in is an arena and it operates in space and time, which God uses to prepare us for eternity. The physical earth is temporary, it is simply a place in which we're going to live out through the body. Every action, uh, every choice that's going to play a role, each scene of life becomes equally a part of our eternity. It says God makes an eternal record of everything we do on the earth. Through faith, each scene of life becomes equally eternally significant. So where you thinking, it don't matter. I'm just a kid. Oh, I still got, I'm young. It does matter. It matters who you choose to be. Because it's going to play a role in your eternal destiny. Thank you for tapping in with Coming Up Believers. Today's lesson, the simulation. The quest for life. Until next time.